Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. Today we continue our best sci-fi Navy series. In our last episode, we broke down the 10 flaws with the Droid Heavy Separatist Alliance Navy. Today we'll be looking at what makes this faction great. Don't forget to stick around to the end of this video where you guys can vote in a poll where you get to rate this faction. In the end, your vote is going to determine which faction wins the best Space Navy series. Also, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of the series. In our last episode, we talked about how short the range of the average droid ship was, which essentially relegates them to a defensive role. Besides this short range, these droid fighters were arguably much better than the ones that the clones fielded. For one, it took the JAR 10 years to grow and train a clone pilot. It took the Separatist Alliance Navy probably an hour to produce a vulture droid. And even though one clone piloted starfighter can defeat a single vulture droid in battle, that clone pilot will definitely lose against 10 vulture droids. A droid starfighter core was simply cheaper to maintain and easier and quicker to produce. Droid ships were also generally smaller than a piloted ship because they didn't have a cockpit, life support, additional shielding and armor around the pilots, and other safety features like inertial dampeners to limit G-forces and ejection seats. Droids therefore had better power to weight ratio and were more maneuverable. One of the most terrifying weapons in the Separatist Alliance Navy was known as the Buzz Droid. Usually fired out of some kind of canister or missile, these were clusters of droid ships that specifically were designed to latch onto enemy ships and cut through the hull, disabling crucial systems and eventually venting the entire craft into vacuum. This was an incredibly terrifying ordeal for organics in a smaller single seat fighter. Very few ships actually had countermeasures to defend against these kind of weapons. All one could do is wait for them to cut through your hull and kill you. And because of the way they were developed and their diminutive size, it was relatively hard to see them on the battlefield, and oftentimes pilots didn't realize they had picked up a buzz droid until it was already doing damage to major critical systems on board. Even when the war was over, there were still many active clusters of buzz droids flying around the galaxy, which proved to be a huge problem for civilian shipping. These were basically space landmines that could only be defeated by Space Princess Diana. The Severus Navy happened to be one of the few factions that heavily relied on missile technology. Missiles were relatively expensive when compared to turbo lasers and other energy weapons, but they more than made up for in performance. See, missiles don't work on a line of sight principle. They could go around obstruction, and they could travel extremely long distances, and allow a ship to attack another ship without necessarily exposing themselves to counterattack. This is especially true in the Star Wars universe, where most of the Separatist Alliance's enemies use line of sight turbo lasers. The payload on a missile was also far more powerful than a turbo laser, although countermeasures were oftentimes more effective against a missile than energy weapons. What made the Separatist Navy so dangerous was that it had line of sight weapons and also missiles. It gave them a lot of options when encountering an enemy. For a force that had a huge weakness against ionic attacks and EMP pulses, the Separatists definitely invested heavily in this technology for their own ships. The command ship Malevolence incorporated a gigantic ionic cannon that could disable the entire fleet on its own. This was an unprecedented amount of firepower for one single ship. I'd argue it's a much more useful weapon against fleets than a Death Star's main laser weapon. The Separatists also used a variety of ion bombs, ion cannons, and ion torpedoes. Combine that with everything else we've talked about, like the buzz droids, the missiles, and the turbo lasers, and you have an incredibly, incredibly dangerous force. The Separatist Navy was first and foremost an offensive military, with an immense amount of destructive power. The Imperial class Star Destroyer could hold a legion of stormtroopers, around 9,000 men. This is a lot of people if you think about it. Not only do you have to house these individuals, you also need to feed them and give them recreation areas. During the Republic era, some clones were stored in stasis pods to save space on ships. But the B-1 battle droid, which I had as a legnotechnic form as a kid, folds up neatly into a small shape. While in this sleep mode, they would recharge and update their software. They took up very little space, so even the smallest capital ships in the droid army could hold a ridiculous amount of troops on board. The Munificent class frigate could hold 150,000 B-1 battle droids, while larger vessels like the Lucre Hulk battleships could hold closer to a million, and the Providence class command ship could hold 1.5 million. This meant that the Separatists could move around massive amounts of troops with relative ease. And should they be really desperate in the middle of a Navy battle, they could just board an enemy ship. Doesn't matter how much more powerful and larger an Imperial class Star Destroyer is compared to a Munificent frigate, because those 150,000 battle droids will definitely beat 9,000 stormtroopers. 
The Separatist Alliance had a much smaller population when compared with the Republic, and all the new worlds that joined the Separatist Alliance during the beginning of the Clone Wars were also smaller colonies. This is why the droids had been chosen in the first place. Heavy civilian casualties were just not sustainable for the Separatist Alliance. The Separatist droid army and navy for the most part was expendable. There was rarely any backlash over the loss of an entire fleet or army. The Separatist leaders saw them as acceptable business expenses or losses. Stop it! What should we do? You stay here! I'll be back! Oh, that's great! This emotional detachment to their troops meant that the Separatist Alliance was very cold and calculating and also very goal-oriented during a battle. This meant that the Navy was more focused and was alright with sacrificing entire portions of the fleet if it served the mission. There are a lot of advantages of having droids crew your entire ship. As we mentioned before, it saves space. Droids are also pretty immune to normal space travel dangers like cosmic radiation, exposure to vacuum, and cold. This meant that hull breaches and other structural damage usually had less of an effect on a Separatist crew. And should you need to repair the ship, a droid could just walk out of an airlock and basically do the repairs without any kind of protective equipment or life support. Technically speaking, Separatist ships didn't even need light support at all, or gravity. This was simply put in because most Separatist ships started out life as a merchant or commerce vessel, which were usually run by a small crew of organic officers. Officers. Droids also didn't get fatigued or needed to be rotated in shifts. They're basically perfect for space navies. Private industry will usually do things twice as fast, twice as cheap, and twice as unethical when compared to the public sector. The Separatist Alliance, being run by a coalition of private corporations, probably ran their military in the same way as a business, with efficiency and focus on performance and cost savings. As a government, the Separatists also put into place heavy censorship of what was actually going on in the war, covering up details about Separatist losses or war crimes committed by the droid armies and navies. This combined with almost no civilian casualties meant that the Separatist Alliance was very resilient to war fatigue. As long as the Separatist Alliance continued acquiring assets, aka new worlds and their resources, they could continue absorbing losses and and carry on the fighting. Although few in numbers, the organic generals and admirals the Separatists did have definitely outclassed their Jedi counterparts when it came to strategy and tactics. This is it. Your first command. Don't be nervous. I wish everyone would stop saying that. I'm ordering you to return to the ship. We're going to need your help. Ahsoka, it's too risky. Get your pilots out of there. Sir, we've got their fighters surrounded. Good. It's too late! Run for it! Most of the Confederacy planets were located in the Outer Rim, where planetary defense forces were much more important and active at fighting bandits and pirates. This meant unlike the Jedi, the Separatist generals and admirals actually had battle experience prior to the war. I have seen his work firsthand. A corporate fleet was blockading Malastare a fleet led by Trench. That's why I recognize the tactics. He tore our ships apart. We barely escaped with our lives. Because most of the central worlds in the Confederacy were located in the free trade zone that had been put in place almost a century before, this also meant that most Separatist central worlds were heavily industrialized. Like we said in our last video, it was basically the China of the galaxy, a massive manufacturing powerhouse that produced a huge amount of diverse products for the rest of the galaxy. One of the major reasons why they wanted to end the free trade zone was because mid-rim and core-rim worlds weren't able to compete with the outer rim anymore. Not only were there no taxes on these worlds, there was more access to natural resources and land was far cheaper to develop. A lack of regulation also meant that corporations were untethered by ethical and safety concerns. It was the ultimate free market capitalist society. This meant that the Separatist Alliance could produce droids and ships at a ridiculously fast rate. If Chancellor Palpatine had been involved with the Separatist Alliance Navy secretly, then the Republic probably would have lost the war within a month. War has begun. Excellent. Everything is going as planned. If you look at the numbers, they just don't add up. At the Battle of Geonosis, the Grand Army of the Clones had 200,000 troopers, while the Separatist Alliance had over 5 million droids. Like Russia or the United States in World War II, the Separatist Alliance has huge industrial capacity that they quickly militarized, turning them into an unstoppable force. 
So guys, those are the 10 advantages with the Separatist Alliance Navy. Now it's time for you guys to vote in the top right corner poll where you get to rate them on a scale of one to five. Your vote matters and will eventually determine which Space Navy wins this competition. Anyway guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of this awesome series. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.